Hello and welcome to week 5 of the NPTEL MOOC course on Economics of Health and Education. In this lesson, we will get introduced to the ideas surrounding demand for education. Now, when we say demand for education, uh, any learner must be introduced to the idea that education is acquired at various levels. There is a demand for primary education, demand for secondary education, demand for tertiary education or higher education as well as demand for various kinds of professional courses or specialized courses that are add-ons after um, higher education or pursuing tertiary education. There is also a demand for vocational education which is an important part of acquiring skills uh, to be a part of the labor force. Now, in this class, uh, we will uh, study uh, about uh, some of the important concepts uh, that needs to be understood as part of demand for education economics. Now, before we do that, I would like to discuss a general reading, a paper with the learners of uh, this course, uh, which is available uh, publicly, uh, licensed by Creative Commons. Uh, however, I am introducing this paper uh, to the learners of this course because I found it very interesting uh, to uh, do a stock taking of some of the important findings surrounding whether or not children are learning in schools or not. So, let us begin with this lesson uh, with uh, the paper by Max Rosa which came out in 2022. Uh, title Millions of Children Learn Only Very Little, How Can the World Provide a Better Education to the Next Generation? Uh, this was published online in ourworldindata.org. Uh, through this uh, lesson, I would also introduce the learners to this website where you can get uh, researched uh, data uh, on uh, various aspects of economics, whether it is about labor markets, education, health uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, since uh, these are licensed by the Creative Commons, you are also free to use uh, this data for your uh, research. Now, let me uh, show a few uh, figures uh, from the paper which uh, I found to be very interesting and worth sharing with the learners of this course. What share of children are not able to read with comprehension by the end of primary school age is a basic question that was asked in this paper. And these are the kind of questions that often we ask in the context of India as well because a lot of funds are spent on primary education, secondary education and so on. Now, if you look at this figure, you would see that the global average is 48 percent, which means that 48 percent of uh, children who have completed primary education or by the end of primary school age are not able to read with comprehension, which is a big figure which means almost close to half the percentage of children who are in primary schools and have finished primary schooling are not able to read with comprehension and this refers to learning losses. But if you look at this figure 1.6 to 3 percent this refers to children in the best performing countries which includes countries like uh, Austria, Finland, Hong Kong, uh, Sweden, Singapore, UK etc where uh, the percentage is much lower. The other important fact that you can uh, see is that in the high income countries the percentage is 9 percent but in the low income countries the percentages rise up to 90 percent and there is a clear income and learning outcomes correlation as far as this figure is concerned which probably gives us the indication that it is mostly in the low income countries or lower middle income countries that despite government spending on primary education, children are not learning adequately, which means that by the end of primary school going age, their reading capabilities have not improved adequately. And therefore, this suggests that this probably has something to do with income. So, Children need to learn to read so that they can read to learn. When we fail to provide this to the next generation, they have very fewer opportunities to lead rich and interesting lives that a good education offers. And it crucially also leaves them in a poorer position to solve the problems of tomorrow. So what explains this large problem? This explains the fact that schooling does not necessarily mean learning. 
For the longest time, from the time we started pursuing the Millennium Development Goals to now when we are still pursuing the Sustainable Development Goals, there has been a lot of focus on increasing enrollments in schools and while enrollments in schools have increased over a period of time, what we have observed is although enrollments have increased, quality of education has not necessarily improved which is what is the pursuit now of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, why does schooling not result in learning? There can be various reasons for it. One is there may be dropouts. Dropouts could be for various reasons, income being only one of the factors, but there could be various reasons that uh, push out children from schools. Schooling may not result in learning because of low attendance of children, children not coming to schools or increasing rates of absence. Uh, many education systems are failing to ensure that children who arrive at school every morning actually learn because of uh, various quality parameters. It could be because of lack of adequate number of teachers, it could be because of lack of adequate infrastructure and so on. Now, what we need to understand is that schools are not just about learning, it is where children socialize, they provide safety, schools provide safety and often food as in the case of midday meal schemes in Indian context and they make it possible for parents to work. So we need the statistics to capture both quantity and quality of education. Uh, quantity referring to how many years a child actually spends at school and also the quality of education showing in the learning outcomes of children. Now look at this uh, figure here, the y-axis shows the test scores in mathematics uh, which are international scores, there are international tests that are carried out for various subjects and this shows the test scores in mathematics, the y-axis shows the annual household incomes of Brazil. Now what this figure shows is that there is a clear correlation between incomes and test scores in mathematics. So lower income households have low scores and as incomes uh, rises, uh, the scores in mathematics also increases. So for example, the poorest household in Brazil, the annual household income is $630, but the test scores of the children are 375. But if you look at the richest household in Brazil, annual household income is $11,000. Uh, $630 but the test scores of the children are also higher which is 477 which gives us the impression that probably income is one of the most defining factors as far as education outcomes is concerned or learning outcomes is concerned but is that so? Now the fact that educational outcomes correlate with households income doesn't mean that income is the only variable that matters here. This is because income itself is correlated with other aspects that matter, for example, the education of the parents. So there may be other confounding variables in income, for example, it may be the case that uh, one has very high incomes but does not have an enabling environment at home in the form of educated parents or a non-noisy household or an environment, safe environment uh, provided to a child for learning, then it may not be possible that it shows up in higher learning outcomes. So household income does not mean that income is the only variable that matters. It also does not mean that children from poor families cannot possibly achieve a very good education. The data shows the averages along the income distribution and makes clear that poor children face much steeper odds. So there are two important points here. One is incomes and test scores seem to be uh, correlated. Lower income households seem to be having uh, children with uh, lower uh, test scores and as the income increases the test scores increases. Uh, but how we interpret this data is one, yes income uh, seems to be having a big correlation but it does not mean that income is the only variable of correlation here. There may be other factors that may be helping income to increase test scores. The second important point here is that poorer children face steeper odds uh, with respect to learning outcomes. But that does not generally mean that children from poor families cannot achieve a very good education. Income is one of the factors but it cannot be the defining factor which explains learning outcomes or lack of learning outcomes. Now this figure here shows uh, the test scores in mathematics for other countries apart from Brazil. And one of the things that comes out from here is that average scores among the poorest students in a rich country are often much higher 
than the scores among richer students in poorer countries. So what this essentially tells us is that while um, incomes play an important role in learning outcomes, we also need to look at within country inequalities to be able to assess whether this relationship holds in all cases. And uh, the uh, global data tells us that the poorest students in a rich country are often much better off than the richest uh, students in a poorer country. So, which means that the overall level of income of a country has an important role to play in learning outcomes. So, differences between countries are often much larger than the differences within countries. Note the performance of Morocco and uh, Brazil or uh, Finland or even South Korea here, you would see that there is clearly a correlation between incomes and test scores as far as Morocco is concerned, which is so for most countries. But the richest uh, uh, students in uh, Morocco are worse off than many of the poorer students in Brazil or Finland and even South Korea. And this is an important point that this figure is trying to make that while income does play an important role in improving learning outcomes, the country that the, uh, that the children are in matters the most when it comes to learning outcomes. Because there are, there are countries that, uh, that provides enabling environments for children uh, to learn irrespective of their incomes. So, differences between countries are often uh, much larger than the differences uh, uh, within countries. The majority of students in Morocco, for example, are doing worse than the poorest students in Brazil. The richest students in Brazil do much worse than even the poorest students in Netherlands, Finland or South Korea. Some of the most successful countries including Finland avoid educational inequalities along the income distribution almost entirely. Uh, the other point that this figure makes is that the steepness of the line indicates how unequal the learning outcomes in a particular country are. A steep line shows a high inequality between the poorest and richest kids in terms of learning outcomes, while a flatter line indicates that the kids from all family backgrounds do similarly well. So, if you look at the line of Finland or uh, Netherlands, you would see that these lines are uh, less steeper than that of Morocco or Tunisia and Brazil. This basically tells us that irrespective of the income differences between households, their scores remains more or less the same, which means that the educational inequalities are much lesser in uh, more equal countries like for example, Finland. For most countries, however, the line slope upwards, which means that students from richer families indeed do better in math scores. And within country differences in learning outcomes are particularly large in those countries with the largest economic inequalities, Brazil being one of them. Brazil's country context can also be seen or contextualized in the case of India, where we see very high levels of income inequality and education inequalities with respect to reading abilities, comprehension abilities are also um, significantly different between the richer households and the poorer households. But test scores may be an abstract metric. The large disparities between countries may be hard to grasp. For example, a test score of 300 in country A and 500 in B may be hard to relate. So therefore, we need to look at these within country inequalities. Now, this is a graph which shows the learning outcomes of children around the world by household income. These are all uh, figures which have been um, uh, retrieved from our world in data and these are licensed under the Creative Commons by the author of this uh, paper and it can be uh, discussed in public forums as well. So, I would encourage all of you to visit this website and look at some of these researched uh, data. Now, what does this figure tell us? This figure shows us uh, within country inequalities on the y axis are the test scores in mathematics, y, uh, the x axis shows the annual household incomes. Now, what this shows is that Students with the same household income tend to reach better educational outcomes if they live in a richer country. The average income level of the country is more important for a student's learning than the income of the particular family within that country. The poorest Korean or Finnish students are poorer than the rich students in Brazil, but their math scores are much higher. 
compare the scores of students whose families have an annual income of $5,000, you find a range from as low as 350 points in poorer countries all the way up to 600 points. Now, in the first few figures, we had seen that income seemed to have a correlation with math scores. But when we looked at within country inequalities, we could uh, see that income is after all, individual household income is after all not an important indicator of scores, but the country that the child is living in has more importance when it comes to uh, scores, subject scores. So, the poorer children living in richer countries tend to perform better because of the uh, because of the intervention made by the education system in improving their uh, test scores. And this is an important uh, conclusion in the context of learning outcomes. So, what are the implications of living in a richer or a better country? In some of the world's richest countries like Finland, the education system is an equalizing force. It gives every child a chance no matter what their family background is. But in many places and even more so in a global uh, scale, these educational differences are actually perpetuating the high levels of inequality. Uh, children from richer backgrounds tend to learn much more and grow up to become more skilled and productive individuals and make themselves in the countries richer in turn. And if we want to stop inequality perpetuating itself through education, we have to raise the quality of education for hundreds of millions of children and the most successful countries show that it is possible. So, this paper gives us the uh, hope that um, while uh, income inequalities cannot be drastically reduced in a short period of time, uh, but despite income inequalities existing, if quality of education receives sufficient policy attention, then the education inequalities can be reduced, which may in turn add to uh, returns. Uh, to edu social returns to education in the long run and which will be beneficial for the uh, country. And this paper also gives us the hope that this is possible because there are experiments that have been carried across in many countries that shows us the way as to where these interventions need to be carried out. Uh, Roser then says that things can change further. We at least live in a world where we no longer face a learning crisis. Uh, a few decades ago, uh, back maybe 40 or 50 years ago, we used to, we faced a learning crisis, uh, meaning that there were not many uh, people in schools, literacy rates were very low, uh, educational achievements were very low. However, we have reached a stage where we are no longer facing a learning crisis because enrollment rates have risen. We are in a better and educated world. Learning was worse in the past. Uh, in the majority of countries, children are learning more now than some years ago and the world is making progress. And we have also been able to reduce uh, education, gender-based education inequalities. The intergenerational inequalities with respect to educational achievements have also come down uh, in the uh, recent years. But despite that, what matters is living standard. Poor education, it has been uh, found is uh, about more than just poor education. Many children struggle to learn because they suffer from poor nutrition, poverty and poor health. And this is the interconnection between education outcomes and various kinds of social security provisions and interventions in the domains of nutrition and health in Indian context, for example, that the learners can very easily uh, understand and connect. Educational progress that countries achieved was made possible by their much broader development. For example, a century ago, one in three children in Singapore died and the country had a GDP per capita of just $3,000. Without its large improvements in child health and growth, the country could not have achieved this. Better health, less poverty and a more nutritious diet can often do more for a child's education than the best teacher. In the context of India, if you look at the National Family Health Survey data, you would see that the rates of stunting have come down uh, drastically. Um, India currently has lesser numbers of uh, stunted children than it had earlier and much of this had been and uh, simultaneously the enrollment rates and the education achievements have also increased. Much of this has been possible because of the interventions that the targeted interventions that have been made in the context of nutrition and health. Now, the midday meal program, 
the various kinds of uh, um, the national rural health program the urban health mission and so on have played a historical uh, role and major roles in improving uh, children's survival and therefore increasing their educational achievements as well this is to give you a context uh, for indian learners now uh, the paper also gives an example of one of the countries where experimentations on increasing children's learning outcomes were carried out one of the countries with the poorest education uh, is uh, guinea bissau an african country a study in the rural parts of this uh, small west african country found that most children do not learn to read and write and they cannot learn it from their parents because less than 3% of mothers can actually pass a simple literacy uh, test This study concluded that the quality of teaching was poor because teachers are isolated, under-equipped, receive salaries after long delays, and have little training. So you would see that much of this, uh, the reduction in learning outcomes, had more to do with uh, infrastructural issues as well as uh, administrative issues, uh, issues uh, relating uh, salaries, and so on. So. Uh, an intervention was carried out in guinea bissau where various simple primary schools were established in uh, different parts of the country and the researchers went to the most difficult places within the country uh, the regions where there were lowest learning levels and worked with people by setting up simple primary schools and then a uh, study was carried out to understand the learning gains uh, made after intervention you would see that there is a control group here and then these are this is the group that received the intervention now before the intervention the mean test score was only 11% and after the intervention the learning outcomes uh, the mean test score is 70% in the treatment group which means that by the simple intervention of starting simple primary schools and ensuring that the children received sustained instructions and uh, learning uh, in the schools the test scores had improved drastically within a short span of time so this goes to provide hope that uh there doesn't need to be uh, huge investments made or huge uh, uh changes made in the education scenario to be able to increase learning outcomes often simple interventions such as ensuring that a teacher stays in school for a sustained period of time or the teacher salaries are paid on time or uh, simple equipments are provided to teachers to be able to impart proper training can go to improve uh, test scores i have uh, provided a link to a youtube video which um, documents the uh, intervention carried out in guinea bissau interested learners can uh, watch the video on youtube now for poor countries we need to find out which opportunities are the most cost effective uh, so the author mentions that we don't need to change the entire schooling system as was done in guinea bissau because the problems that hold back children Uh, differ from place to place and there are no universal solutions to the problems that many countries face the research on cost effectiveness in education shows that the best interventions can be extremely cost effective and the most cost effective programs deliver the equivalent of 3 additional years of high quality schooling that is 3 years of schooling at a quality comparable to the highest performing education systems in the world for just 100 dollars per child Now what are the changes that can achieve so much with so little the author lists three important things one is avoiding overly ambitious curricula and teaching at the right level second is improved pedagogy and lesson plans and third is providing information on returns to education these three important points can go on to improve uh, learning outcomes of children in primary schools can improve drastically learning outcomes which has a uh, long term private and social returns to education for the individual concerned as well as the society at large so with this uh, general reading now i would like to introduce you the ideas of demand for education uh, we understand that there is a demand for quantity of education and there is a demand for quality of education by quantity of education we mostly refer to the number of years an individual chooses to be in education from primary to secondary to tertiary education and so on and by quality of education we refer to the kind of skills or the kind of uh, uh, training that is required by the uh, learners who want to be in education okay so now let's uh, 
ask the simple question as to why people go to schools. To be able to understand demand for education, we need to um, familiarize ourselves with this question from an academic point of view. Now, education can be looked at in two broad ways. One is education as creation of minimum capabilities and second is education as investment in human capital. Now, uh, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen puts forward the idea of functioning wherein he says that the ability to read, calculate and process information so as to live a normal life with dignity is creation of minimum capabilities or the capabilities that can help you to achieve things that you would never have imagined. Uh, similarly, scholars like Gary Becker and others have portrayed education as an investment in human capital. We need to be able to understand what are these and what is the distinction between the two. What is the distinction between education as creation of minimum capabilities and education as investment in human capital. Let us begin with education as creation of minimum capabilities. Now, Ownership of an economic resource may not always generate utility because the person may not be able to get benefits from its use. This brings in the necessity of functioning that helps individuals carry out ordinary business of life. Now, simple capabilities such as uh, reading and computing can help us perform many tasks of a normal social life like finding a street address, enrolling uh, our children in school, reading instructions, etc. So, some level of education always creates additional utility. So, uh, creation of minimum capabilities can provide a utility, can result in utility. A list of ordinary life facts that require some education in order to be performed successfully may be using public transport, finding a street address, checking a bill, signing a check, reading instructions on electrical appliances or medicine strips, etc. and so on. Now, second is education as investment in human capital. In the previous case of education as creation of capabilities, it is not very hard to understand. I have often taken the example of sense bicycle where uh, learning to ride a bicycle becomes a capability uh, that is a capability that can help you to achieve various functionings, the ability to freely move around, the ability to uh, go to school, to college or the ability to uh, simply uh, move around and acquire information and so on and so forth. So, the capability of uh, being able to read and write can help you to uh, get exposed to a world of knowledge. So, in that sense, uh, demand for education as creation of capability is one of the most basic demands on the uh, part of individuals. Now, when it comes to education as investment in human capital, it is slightly more complicated than education and uh, than demand for um, creation of minimum capabilities. So, often individuals choose to attain education beyond the minimum requirement. So, for example, there may be a minimum requirement of being in education for um, 15 years, but uh, what is the necessity or why does an individual make the choice to stay in education for more than 15 years? This is because education like that of health also acts as an investment good. So, you are investing in your, your the time investment, the money investment, the resources invested uh, becomes uh, human capital in a later period of time. So, educational choices are considered to be smart investment decisions where current income opportunities are foregone in exchange for better income prospects in the future. Usually when the individual decides to be in higher education for a longer period of time, this is based upon the expectation that being in education, acquiring those professional skills or acquiring higher education will result in better returns in a future period of time. And it is because of these better income prospects that the individual takes the decision of investing in her or his in, uh, education in the current period of time. Now, buying a capital good today helps us earn rents, but also there is a net depreciation associated with its usage. Physical capital, for example, is demanded up to the point where marginal productivity is equal to user cost. Here, we need to distinguish between physical capital and human capital. Often, when we are buying a house in the present period, under the assumption that it will uh, provide us returns in the longer run because it may be given out on rent, which is income in the current period, 
the decision to uh, make an investment in a house or a car or any physical asset is made under the expectation that it will provide certain sure rates of return. But is it so in the case of human capital as well is what we must understand. Now, so the question is why do individuals choose to continue education beyond minimum requirement? One approach is to look at education as a commodity. People go to school because they enjoy acquiring new knowledge and standard theory of utility maximization predicts that the optimal demand for education will be when marginal utility of additional knowledge is equal to the marginal disutility of giving up alternative uses of time involved or in other words uh, the time that is required to get additional knowledge is equal to the time that you are not interested in to giving up alternative uses of the time involved. So, can the same be said for tertiary or higher education is the uh, question here. Now, tertiary education probably cannot be perceived as merely a commodity. In the case of tertiary schooling or education, cost increases significantly when compared to secondary education. Without any evidence of increased uh, satisfaction in attending university lectures. Now, generally, individuals do not want to spend uh, long hours uh, pursuing education because there is nothing particularly pleasurable or satisfactory about uh, spending time uh, reading uh, professional books or uh, skill uh, earning books. So, tertiary education cannot be conceived of merely as a commodity. It does not fulfill one satisfaction in the short run. But despite that, why do individuals spend that much time on education is important for us to understand here. It is here that we could look at tertiary education choice as an investment decision, uh, putting up with the pain of acquiring a higher education because it is an investment that you are making in the short run to be able to get returns in the long run. Uh, so, here we could look at tertiary education choice as an investment decision where current income opportunities are renounced in exchange for better future income prospects. This is equivalent to purchasing a production unit today in order to obtain the rents associated with its ownership um, minus the depreciation. But we need to ask this question if the analogy between investment in physical capital and investment in human capital is correct or not, whether it is precise or not. We need to understand the distinction between investment in physical capital and human capital because it is depreciation involved and the depreciation that applies to physical capital applies to human capital. So, let us try to understand in this manner, human capital is basically incorporated in human beings and it cannot be resold. How much skills I have acquired over the period of last 20 years being a, a teacher in an institution of national importance is something which is embodied inside me. It is embodied capital. I cannot separate the skills that I have acquired over the period of last 20 years from myself and uh, loan it out to somebody else or rent it out to somebody else. So, in that sense, human capital is embodied capital. It is incorporated in human beings. Physical capital can be acquired at almost any desired amount in boom periods and can be resold during recession on secondary markets. So, I can buy a house or a car or something else and I can uh, resell it at some period of time because my existence with respect to the physical capital that I have acquired are separate entities. But the human capital that I have acquired because of being in education for a longer period of time or uh, being in interaction with various uh, students and colleagues over a period of time, carrying out research over a period of time is something which is embodied in me and I cannot separate myself from the capital that I have acquired over a period of time. Further, human capital can be acquired mostly at the beginning of an individual's life. The pace of accumulation is determined by physiological factors and it cannot be resold. Usually, when we make the decision of being in higher education or pursuing higher education, it is made in the beginning uh, years of our life. So, we decide to pursue education till the age of 25 or till the age of 30 because there is a life cycle within which all of these function. You cannot acquire uh, very uh, long years of education in the middle of your lifespan. It all happens at the beginning of your uh, lifespan. So, the feature of human capital being embodied in human being 
and being irreversible lead to many market failures or we could say that the feature of human capital being embodied in human beings and being acquired in the beginning stages of life and thus being irreversible is a special characteristic of education demand for education which where we see that the markets do not operate uh, optimally or efficiently we can exemplify this further by two important points for example when you are taking a loan from a bank for physical investment we can collateralize the physical uh, asset but while taking education loan we cannot collateralize the incorporated knowledge within us so if i have to uh, take a loan for further education then i do not collateralize my knowledge that i have acquired or the knowledge that i will be acquiring post my education and uh, therefore the education loan but that is not so in the case of physical investments when we are collateralizing physical assets let's say a house uh, or land when we are taking a loan so that's one of the basic differences that difference arises because of human capital being embodied in human beings the second point is that there is a possibility of moral hazard in case of human capital but not in case of physical capital the possibility of moral hazard is that the future benefits of acquiring education are conditional on exerting adequate effort in the labor market but it is impossible to predict if the individual concerned will put that effort in the labor market in future or not so for example uh, as a parent i may invest in the education of my child uh, however i do not know what will be the conditions of the labor market in future whether my child after having been invested in education now will be able to find employment in the labor market or whether the child himself or herself will be able to put that effort in the labor market to earn some wages so then i am running the risk of a moral hazard here because my investment may not pay me any returns in the future because of the child's inability to find an employment in the labor market or because of the labor market conditions that may not have enough employment opportunities for the child to be um, uh, to be employed so in that sense the current investment in education is riskier than any other financial investment at least from the point of view of the investing agents who are the parents in this case the final distinction is that an owner of physical capital has some degree of control over it they may be a bona fide capitalist or a rentier that is drawing an income from capital or rent from the property in future but that is not so in the case of a uh, of human capital an educated person who owns his or her human capital cannot employ it in a production process unless i am hired as a dependent worker in which case i become a wage earner so human capital does not command the same market power as does physical capital so what we have uh, studied now is to be able to differentiate between uh, human capital and physical capital and why it is important to understand the distinction between physical capital and human capital is that demand for education or education like health is a special good it's a, it's a good that cannot be provided by the uh, unregulated market there has to be some kind of an intervention because of the nature of the good in question here uh, human capital uh, has various special characteristics starting from it being embodied in human beings to the possibility of moral hazard uh, because of various uh, factors that can impact the employability of the person on whom the investment is being made and finally the fact that uh, human capital cannot be employed in a production process unless hired as a dependent worker the asset in itself will provide returns only if used by someone else so to be able to understand uh, demand Uh, for education we need to understand uh, it within the framework of model of human capital investment uh, the standard model of human capital investment argues that each individual will acquire education up to a point where the cost of acquisition equals the benefit of acquisition and uh, there are two conclusions for that one is that uh, if if i understand that i am a very talented person and i know that because of my talent i will be able to earn better in future but my talent can be used in future only if i remain in education for some more period of time 
let us say that if I assume that I am good in maths and therefore I need to pursue technical education for a sufficiently long period of time that can help me get employment after 5 years or 6 years then my demand for education will go up. So, the uh, inherent talent within an individual is one of the important factors that can impact demand for education in the long run and in the economics of education often this uh, is referred to as unobservable ability or talent. So, more talented people will demand more education because their marginal return is higher. So, talent is an important factor of demand for education. The second is the demand for education is higher when future expected gain is higher relative to current earnings. When you when the future expected gain is higher could be higher because of various factors. So, for example, let us say I am uh, trained in a certain sector and I believe that uh, the future employment conditions or economy conditions are such that my sector will be able to provide me better earnings in the future then my demand for education will also increase because I would want to spend uh, or invest more time in my education in the current period. We can understand this with the help of visualization here. You would see that uh, this refers to um, the y axis here refers to costs and returns, uh, costs incurred by the individual for uh, acquiring education and the returns for education and the x axis here refers to education in years of schooling. Uh, this, uh, this is a basic model of human capital investment where we are seeing what will be the optimal choice that the individual makes with respect to the years of schooling that he or she wants to be in. So, suppose an individual is somehow optimally choosing this point E1 where and corresponding to the intersection of marginal cost curve here which refers to the cost of education acquisition it keeps on increasing over a period of time and the uh, downward sloping curve basically tells us the marginal returns to education. So, uh, somehow she has optimally chosen this uh, uh, point A here or the in terms of quantity of education uh, the individual has chosen to be for these many duration to be in education. But when she expects that in the next period there will be an increase in demand for skilled labor uh, or uh, demand for professional labor, she might want to increase professional expertise by remaining in, in education for a longer period of time. So, which means that she is expecting greater marginal returns to education. So, the marginal returns to education curve shifts rightward and then the optimal uh, point at which uh, also uh, changes because of the intersection, the new intersection point with the marginal cost of acquiring education. The cost of acquiring education also rises, but essentially what has happened is that the quantity of uh, education, the quantity of years, the number of years that the individual needs to be in education also increases. So, the expected returns to education in the future period is one of the important factors that goes on to explain demand for education in the current period. Uh, it, this uh, figure has been summarized in this uh, slide here. The cost schedule is upward sloping depicting increasing costs both monetary and non-monetary for higher levels of education. Monetary costs of education is understood you have fees, you have uh, lab costs, you have transportation costs and so on and so forth. Non-monetary costs refers to the uh, pain and the hard work and the effort and the opportunities uh, foregone in the current period that also goes into the calculation of cost of acquiring that education. As I have mentioned earlier that university education or acquiring professional skills in higher education is not necessarily a pleasurable task for all individuals. The return schedule is downward sloping following the decreasing returns in production technology assumption of microeconomics and time devoted to education here means the years of schooling. So, this figure helps us to this figure here helps us to understand why different individuals demand different amounts of education uh, and we have already seen that with uh, talent individuals may experience a higher marginal return for any portion of time invested in education. So, in this class uh, we uh, have introduced the ideas of demand for education. We began uh, with the general reading 
on um, schooling uh, uh, learning outcomes, uh, why millions of children who go to school do not learn. Uh, we have seen that there are various reasons uh, that go to explain uh, the lack of learning outcomes. Uh, income seemed to be one of the most important factors that correlated with learning outcomes, the representative indicator being test scores in mathematics. We saw that children belonging to poorer households seem to have poorer grades or test scores uh, and vice versa. But when we looked at uh, between countries and within countries inequalities, we saw that while it is true that income seems to have a correlation with uh, scores, we also found that uh, richer children in poorer countries have worse outcomes than poorer children in richer countries, which means that the country in question or the overall standard of living or overall incomes of the country and the uh, overall forces within the country, whether there are equalizing forces or whether, whether there are unequalizing forces have a lot uh, to uh, impact with respect to uh, test scores. So, more equal countries, educationally equal countries, for example, Finland or Sweden have better uh, learning outcomes than uh, the more unequal countries. So, the levels of income within a country has an important role to play. Another important uh, uh, thing we discussed in the general reading is that often innovative investments or investments that does not require changing of the entire system altogether will go a long way in improving quality of education. Because when we talk about demand for education, we are talking about quantity of education as well as quality of education. While quantity of education in various countries across the world have increased, but quality of education still has a lot of work to be carried out. And the author points out three important uh, uh, factors, one with regard regard to pedagogy, uh, in improving pedagogy, uh, teaching students at the right level and the author also refers to uh, increasing uh, investments among uh, children as one of the important factors that can go to explain uh, increasing uh, learning outcomes. Then finally, we got introduced to the model of human capital, of the human capital framework to understanding demand for education. We made a distinction between physical capital and human capital. We understood the, uh, the special characteristics of uh, education because of which we categorize it as human capital and what are the important factors that goes towards increasing demand for education. We will continue with this class in the next lesson. Uh, till then, see you. Thank you. Thank you.